welcome to our next podcast. This is The Pet Factor. I'm Dr. Jim Hosek. I'm Brittany. And this week, um, for our wellness topic, we're going to talk about spaying and neutering your cats and dogs mm -hmm. and rabbits and ferrets and, and yep. other things that need those procedures. Um, so basically, a lot of people ask, what exactly is spaying and neutering? Because they maybe don't even actually yep. know what we're doing to the animals. And basically, it's sterilizing the animals so they can't reproduce mm -hmm. and in the females we're typically removing the ovaries and the uterus and in the males we're removing the testicles so spaying is what we call the female one yep. neutering is what we call it the males because it's nicer than castration yeah but um they're basically <laughs> all neutering uh sometimes referred to as altering mm -hmm which I guess is a nice way of saying it as well. Yeah. Um, and as to why we do it, there's, a, there's a, a bunch of reasons why we do it. And the biggest reason is pet population control. Yeah. Uh, one thing I read the other day was one and a half million animals admitted to shelters are euthanized every mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot. That's a that's lot of That's about a quarter of the animals that come in um, aren't getting homes. They're getting put to sleep because they have no, no place to go. Mm -hmm. So... Yes, breeders are going to be breeding animals. They usually already have people that want those puppies and mm -hmm. kittens, um, so that's not a big deal. In Germany, you can't even breed a dog unless you have people lined up to take the pets. Well, I think, like, to have a breeder, you should have a license anyway. Yeah. Because, like, I feel like most people think you have a boy, you have a girl, so you're a breeder. You're not a breeder. You can't just Google things and be like, okay, this is what I learned about the breed. I'm going to mm -hmm. breed it now. Which, unfortunately, most animals that end up in shelter are, come from cases like that. And a lot of people think it's, it's an easy way to make money. They're mm -hmm. going to sell these puppies for $1,000 a piece. But there's a lot of expenses that go along with there. There's a lot of things that can uh -huh. go wrong. They need veterinary care if there's an emergency and they yep. need a C-section. There goes your profits right there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not something that you do as a hobby. No. This is something that people who are really interested in the breed want to really produce really good quality animals, mm -hmm. are really uh, careful about the genetics and make sure they're not passing on health problems or, mm -hmm. or taking responsibility for. The other big reason why we do the spaying and neutering is health reasons. Yeah. Um, there are so many health issues that occur in the non-spayed and non-neutered animals. I can pretty much guarantee if an animal hasn't been spayed or neutered, they're going to develop one of these problems. Mm -hmm. um, in females, the biggest thing is mammary tumors, yeah. breast cancer, basically. Mm -hmm. um, in dogs, half of them are malignant, and cats, 90%. We talked about Frida last week was yep. a cat that had a, a mammary tumor that came back, yep. um, had spread to another part of her body. Um, you can also get cancer of the ovaries. Mm -hmm. You get cancer of the testicles and cancer of the prostate disease. So those are all things that we're eventually going to see in these animals. A big thing, too, in the female dogs, because they never stop going in the heat, you may not notice it as much, is pyometra, which is an infection mm -hmm. that gets into the uterus. So basically, their uterus fills with pus. It's really disgusting. Yep. Sometimes you might see a discharge from their rear end, but all the times they may just kind of be acting sick. They may be drinking a lot more water than mm -hmm. normal, having some vomiting, some diarrhea. Their belly may be distended. Yeah. Yeah. may not be. Um, we'll take an x-ray, and we'll be able to see the big fluid-filled uterus on the x-ray. Mm -hmm. And those animals need to have surgery right away, right away, especially if they're not having any drainage. There's been some rare cases where you maybe have a breeding animal, and you want to treat it with antibiotics and hormones to help uh, pull it, push that pus out. But you always run the risk of the uterus rupturing yeah. and developing into a peritonitis. So you take the, the infected uterus out, they recover very quickly. Mm -hmm. It's a lot more expensive than spaying and neutering, which is why we recommend <laughs> doing it. But that's certainly something we can do. In the male dogs that live long enough, every single one of them will develop prostate problems. Mm -hmm. Just like yep. in people, that prostate gets enlarged, yep. it can bleed, it can interfere with their ability to urinate mm -hmm. or an ability to defecate. They can get infections and abscesses and cysts on the prostate, and mm -hmm. they can get cancer on the prostate. And removing the prostate in the dog is a very delicate procedure. It has to be referred out to a, a urology um, surgeon who's done that procedure before. And it's 100% preventable by <laughs> getting them neutered. Yep. Uh, we can treat mild prostate disease by even neutering the dog when they're older. Yeah. So if we have a dog that has uh, an enlarged prostate um, and they're not neutered, I'll just say, let's get it done. Another condition I'll see, not quite as uh, miserable for the animals or deadly, is perianal adenomas. They're a type of hormone that grows around the anus, oh. and it occurs primarily in unneutered male dogs. Mm. And the hormones just stimulate these glandular tissues there, and they cause these little growths that occur. A lot of times, just by neutering them, the growths will go away. You don't oh. even have to excise those. Because it's getting rid of that. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. 
And then the third reason is behavior. Uh, an yeah. unneutered animal has all those hormones raging through their body. Mm -hmm. They may be more aggressive towards other animals. Uh, dealing with animals in heat can be messy, yep. especially female dogs. Cats, more annoying than uh -huh. anything else. They can be in heat for a couple of weeks. They're going to rub up against you. They're going to mm -hmm. cry. They're going to make all sorts of noise. Mm -hmm. um, I had one male dog. Um, he smelled a female dog in heat. He jumped through their plate glass window yep. of their house into the street, got a big six-inch gash on the mm -hmm. side, and I've had animals jump out of cars, yep. jump through screens. Well, um, the highest rating um, missing dogs or dogs in shelter always are intact right. because they get out. Like, you know, females, males, they always get out because that's instinctively what they want right. to do. No matter how well you think you have them in the house, they find a way to get out and they find a way to do what instinct is telling them to do. Then they end up in a yes. shelter or something like that. And and by spaying and neutering them early, you eliminate that behavior, and mm -hmm. you have a wonderful pet. Um, you could always go and clone them later on if you want to copy. Uh, I don't yeah. know if that's an option. <laughs> yeah, they, they are doing I mean, it. It's pretty expensive. I'll say if they're not willing to spay or neuter, they're probably not willing to clone yet. So Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you're getting a, a dog or cat, make sure it's, a lot of shelters are mm -hmm. already spaying and neutering them before they even adopt them out. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times they come to us already spayed and neutered. But if they haven't been, they get that uh, appointment scheduled and get that taken care of. Um, there's sometimes here um, some breeders recommending spaying them later in life. We usually like to do it around six months of age. Yeah. Some breeders will tell people, oh, wait till nine months or wait till they've had a heat. Yeah. We definitely recommend against that in yeah. most cases. Mm -hmm. um, every time they go through heat, makes them more likely to have breast tumors. Mm -hmm. um, there are some larger breeds dogs, uh, some of the hounds, that has been shown neutering them later in life is beneficial to their development. Yeah. So for some specific breeds, we may delay it for uh, six months or 12 months. Um, but absolutely, there's there's been no studies showing that there's any significant harm to most dogs and cats for having it done young. Next, I want to talk about what a pet owner should expect when they bring their animals in for their spay and mm -hmm. neuter. Um, there's several ways you can have it done. There's some um, spay and neuter clinics that do yeah. it very inexpensively, assembly line type things. Um, and then there's clinics like ours that are going to treat these as a major surgery that they are. Mm -hmm. So when an animal comes in for their spay and neuter appointment, there's several things we're going to do before we even... Uh, do the procedure. We're going to give them a thorough physical exam. Yeah. With the males, we're going to make sure the testicles are there. Mm -hmm. They're not uh, cryptorchids where the testicles haven't descended. And we're going to do a lab test to double check their kidney function, liver function, blood sugar, like we discussed yep. the wellness uh, test last yep. week. Yep, make sure they're good for surgery. Right. Um, and we'll give them a little sedative and some uh, preoperative pain medication so that the anesthetics work smoother and they're not in any discomfort. Mm -hmm. During the surgery, it's very care very important that they be on IV fluids, that they be monitored, they're intubated, and are given gas anesthesia for the procedure. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll typically, we'll use a local anesthetic along the incision as well to help with the, the post-surgical pain. Um, after surgery, uh, we're going to send them home with some pain pills. Um, they may need a collar or a t-shirt or something to keep them from traumatizing their incision. Mm -hmm. But most of them heal up pretty well. Yep. Um, I usually try not to put any skin sutures on the outside. You try and, and bury all the sutures. You can't always do that. Yep. But it makes it a much easier recovery if there's not those itchy stitches there to mm -hmm. and make them lick at their incision. Well, and then, like, there's one thing we always get asked sometimes for the hyper dogs. We can always send home with calming medication. Yeah. Um, we do this more often than not, especially for our young hyper breeds, um, which is also okay too. You just give it to them like you would their pain medication and it just helps yeah. calm them, keep them calm, you know, helps prevent having to have another surgery again right. because they ripped open the incision site or something like that. Commonly we'll see them develop uh, hematomas or seromas, mm -hmm. which is fluid buildup uh, around the incision that typically will resolve, but it can be avoided by just restricting their activity mm -hmm. for the week after surgery, and then they can go crazy nuts and do whatever they want. Yeah. I think that's the biggest problem is that the animals feel so good after surgery, yeah. the pain meds and stuff, they say, hey, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> Usually once that anesthesia is out of their system, they think they can take on the world again. It's like, right. no, major surgery just happened. <laughs> 
And one thing we promote here at Merrick is uh, Spay Neuter Month, which is during February. Yep. Um, Cook County, which is uh, where we're located in near Chicago, um, has this program. They've been running for, I think, about 10 or 12 years, where they'll actually give an extra $40 rebate um, mm-hmm. to pet owners who have their pets spayed and neutered during February. Nice. They have to be vaccinated for rabies. There's a limit of two pets per house, but it's really kind of a nice way to do it. And yeah. it works out that it seems like a lot of pets need to be spayed and neutered yeah. in October. Well, and that, that also helps, too, because it's not just limited to puppies or kittens. Like, right. it's literally just anything that is still intact. Mm-hmm. You know, you can... Yeah, they do cover rabbits yeah, and ferrets. They just yeah, co- they cover almost every pet that you can have in a house for spaying and neutering. Right. Just because, again, we want to control that animal population and, you know, help with their health. And then there's World Spay Day, which is February 26th, which falls during Spay Neuter Month, which is kind of nice. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's a big holiday around here. Yeah. Well, they have a good time. I would say it's sad for them, especially since it's like Valentine's Month, but, eh, you know, <laughs> it's okay they get yeah. enough lovings. Right. Okay, next we're going to move on to pet health news. Um, and this month we've got a bunch of new products that are coming out that I wanted to talk about. Um, the first one, now that we've had this medication, Clomacone, for a long time for dealing with pet separation anxiety, but the FDA has just approved a cheaper version of it, a generic version. So that's going to open it up to a lot of people who weren't able to use it for their pets. Hmm. Um, separation anxiety um, typically affects older animals over six months of age. And they, they exhibit certain behaviors. Um, it can be excessive barking, destructive acts, mm-hmm. chewing on furniture, yep. urinating or defecating in the house, intense pacing uh, when they're left alone. Uh, and this can be, is, they're left alone only for a few minutes, they yeah. can start doing this. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very common, it's diagnosed about 20 to 40% of the dogs referred for animal behavior practices in North America, according to one of the things. Um, but it's something that a lot of times people will ask us, what can we do? There are behavior modification techniques you can do to try and get them less stressed when you're leaving. Um, But if you do it with the Clomacol medication, it makes it work a lot better. This is not a message you just give them and the the behavior goes away. There is some training that has to go along with that. So the fact that it's less expensive, if it's something that you had thought about before and was too expensive, ask your vet. That's going to be coming out soon. And then you'll be able to hopefully get their their condition uh, under better control. All right. The next one is a uh, extended release version of a medication we use all the time here for incontinence in dogs. Um, it's ex- once a day proin. So typically proin will give two or three times a day depending on the dog. But now they've made it into an extended release count. Um, they've got four different dosage sizes that are going to be available this probably early next year. And the neat thing about this uh, is that the dogs can actually chew on the tablet and won't affect the extended release um, uh-huh. properties of it. So uh, with urinary incontinence, we can see these sometimes occur after a female dog's been okay. spayed. Yeah. I think it happens about 1% of all female dogs. Yeah. Um, typically it can start affecting them as early as two years of age, as late as 10 or 12 years of age. Um, so if your dog is having leaking of their urine, particularly when they're sleeping, mm-hmm. Um, or they get up and urine drips out of them and they're not aware of it, that's urinary incontinence and that needs to get checked out. Always make sure we check them for a, a bladder infection too, or stones, but those are things that, that can be possibilities. Um, another neat thing that's coming out is, is called Fur Baby Tracker. Hmm. And this is an app, a communications app, between veterinarians and client owners whose pets are being hospitalized. Oh. So it's going to be able to provide real-time communication between the pet, animal, the pet hospital and the pet owner, okay. give up to 15 updates a day, um, and works by text message or app notification. So it allows the um, veterinary staff not to be on the phone all the time talking with the owners and just dealing with the patients, but they'll be able to just check in and update the clients as to each stage hmm. procedures that are being done so they know what's going on with their pet at any particular time. That's cool. So it sounds like it's going to be a service that they're going to have a little charge for, so you might pay an extra $20, $30, and you get these updates uh, throughout the day with your pet, hot, your pet. So it's kind of like a restaurant. When you put your order in, and then you can watch it online, your food, your order is getting right. made, whatever. They are cooking it. It's been picked up. It's getting right. delivered. Your dog is being anesthetized. Exactly, your dog yeah. is starting surgery. Your dog is awake. Yeah, so we're just catching up yeah we'll get well and once we we see more about that that's coming out we'll we'll check it and get back to you and let yeah. you know what's about that now there's been these genetic tests for dogs for a long time uh, the first one was the mars wisdom panel now they finally come out with one for cats, cats. all right <laughs> it's called base paws which i guess is a play on base pairs which is 
the DNA based yeah. pairs, right? And um, this is going to be coming out as a at home test, uh, probably be a saliva test, just like the the dog one is. Okay. They're going to be able to check for thirty nine genetic mutations in the initial test, which mm. corresponds to seventeen different genetic health conditions, which I think is really helpful, especially when you have these stray cats. You don't know their genetic yeah. history. Um, some of the diseases that they can check for are polycystic kidney disorder, and I've treated some cats for that. That's pretty pretty awful. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, yeah. uh, retinal degeneration, and then they can also offer information on the cat's heritage, so the hmm. breeds that it might be made up. So oh. people come in, what kind of cat is mine? We say it's a domestic short hair. That's our, a nice way of saying yeah. alley cat. Um, but this way we'll be able to say, hey, you've got maybe a little bit of Siamese in there, or a little bit of... Um, Some Maine Coon. Maine Coon, yeah. Just Fancy. I nice. think that's that's going to be really nice. That'll be fun. Um, there's a new um, stem cell company coming out. So stem cells have been in use for uh, over a decade now in small animal medicine, two decades in equine medicine. And the problem has always been it's been very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, for the older dogs, what we do is they're coming in, we're harvesting their fat, then we're sending it to the lab and then injecting it in. But these dogs are maybe 9, 10 years old, maybe older. They've got bad arthritis. What this company's do is they're taking the tissue from when the animals are spayed and neutered and banking okay. those stem cells from those. Yeah. And then um, they have uh, two plans. One's just $95 a year. The other one is $5.95 for a lifetime storage. Mm -hmm. And then when you need the stem cells later on, if they develop uh, osteoarthritis or joint problems or some other th condition that can be treated with stem cells, it's just a $300 fee to process the cells or ship mm. them out. So they can sit there for... They can stay frozen years? for the life of the pet. Yeah. Wow. So the the goal is hopefully you will never need to use these, but if you've got an animal that's prone to a lot of genetic conditions or arthritis yeah. or hip dysplasia, it's good to have those because you're using the stem cells from when they're young and healthy yeah. rather than when the stem cells when they're old and having problems. <laughs> so that company is called Gallant. Their website is gallant.com. So if you want to check that out, go there and, and check out their information. Interesting. Yeah. This is a really cool story, and this drives Jenny, our other tech, crazy whenever I do stories about eyes. This Nebraska woman, she lives in Nebraska, but she um, was vacationing in California. And she was on a trail run, and she went through a swarm of flies. They were so thick, she was batting them from their face, and she even swallowed uh, some of them. And in, back in March of 2018, this was about a, maybe a month after she had uh, gone through this thing of flies, her right eye was getting irritated. So she flushed it out with some tap water in her sink, and then moments later, a half inch long wriggly roundworm emerged from her eye. Ah. This is from not from the eyeball itself, but from the conjunctival sac yeah. around the eye. So she noticed the second one and removed it. Ugh. Okay, so, so she was just removing them in her bathroom? Yeah, that's pretty, uh -huh. pretty gross. So she went to the eye doctor, because that's what you do when you find worms in your eye. Ah. Uh, in California there, and the doctor removed a third worm <gasps> from the woman's eye. Uh, he preserved it in formaldehyde and sent it off to the Center for Disease Control, and they were able to identify it as Thalasia glossa, which is a parasitic eye worm found in cattle. And oh. it's transmitted from cow to cow by flies that feed on the cow's uh, tears. Tears. And so oh. it ingests the eggs that way, and then the, those... Um, so is flies it because will she poop in the cat's eye or the cow's eyes and pass the worms through. So is it because she ate the worms or is it because it hit her eyes? Because it, it hit her eye. Oh. Yeah. So then they put her on some eye some antibiotics for the eye and she went home and then about a month later she noticed another worm in her eye. Oh my god, no. Okay. So <laughs> after that, the inflammation went away and she hasn't seen any since. But that was four worms from just one oh, encounter nice. with that swarm. It's actually the second case of this particular parasite affecting people that's been reported. The last one was in 2016. This was a 26-year-old woman who was um, on a horseback riding and fishing trip in Oregon. In California, yes. So that's kind of kind of weird. Um, so this may be emerging as a new zoonotic disease, which is a uh. disease that spread from animals to people in the United States. Um, so it's just really kind of... An interesting thing, I love parasites. We talked about the Diactophyma renale last week, but this has got to be getting up on my list of favorite parasites here, the eye worm. Yeah, this is why people need to stay in bubbles. No, no, no. 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 Just be careful, and if you do, flush your eyes out really well if you ever get a, a flies in there. All right, our next story is actually um, from uh, Nationwide Pet Insurance. It has this award they give out every year called the Hambone Award. Hmm. 
which is the most interesting claims they've had on their pet health insurance. And we <laughs> recommend pet health insurance here. We don't use Nationwide, but it's, it's a company that provides excellent service. So the first place went to this uh, cat named Minnow. And Minnow had originally been adopted by this woman and um, her late husband, Graham. And they had gone to a shelter and they looked at Minnow, they couldn't decide. They went home, the next day she called the shelter and said, hey, you know, I think I want to adopt that cat. They told her, sorry, the cat's already been adopted. Aww. But it was her husband who had gotten the cat and brought it <laughs> home to her. Nice. Okay, so he passed away and she moved to Atlanta. And the, Minnow was not originally an indoor cat. And she had a tough time keeping her as an indoor cat. So she let Minnow wander from time to time. And she would stay around the house, but she'd gradually get further and further away. But she always came home. But then this one time she didn't come home and she yeah. just couldn't find her. So she was worried about her. She was searching the neighborhood, trying to find her. And she found herself in her car, and she just was talking to her dead husband and said, Graham, if you could bring Minnow home with me again, that'd be great. The next morning, she goes out to the garbage can, and there's Minnow. What? Hungry, uh, malnourished, had a broken rib, oh, but goodness. responded to treatment and came and uh, was dehydrated and came back to health and did really well. Oh, she was missing for three weeks. So she needed wow. Graham to bring her home. <laughs> Oh, so you know, the, and the and pet health insurance covered all the costs for for taking care of her, which nice. was really nice. Second place went to Max, a Great Pyrenees from San Marcos, and he got his head too close to a hog trap. Ooh. And I don't know what exactly what a hog trap is, but I'm assuming it's for hunting wild hogs. Yeah. Uh, so that could not have been very uh, nice, but I think just the word hog trap gets him second place there. Yeah. yeah. Third place went to uh, Jasper. This was a cat from uh, Texas who was treated for heat exposure because he fell asleep in the dryer and got in the fluff cycle there. So always, first of all, don't leave clothes in your dryer if you're going to turn it back on and check the door or your cats are there. I've seen this many times where cats get stuck in the dryer. Uh, Fourth uh, place went to Frank, and he's a Rottweiler who found himself in a um, prickly situation after a porcupine put some quills (laughs) up his nose. Those porcupines. Spur- oh, and those things are tough to get out. Uh-huh. They really have to be sedated for that. And fifth place went to Tippy, a border collie mix from uh, California, and he barreled into a steel trailer hitch while playing fetch and injured her nose. Yep. yep. So, yeah, watch where you're throwing those balls. The dogs are more interested in looking at the ball and not where they're mm-hmm. going, and so that can be a problem. So that was kind of fun. I yeah. thought that was kind of neat that they have this award. Well, that one reminds me of the um, Rhodesian Ridgeback we saw a few years ago it was chasing a squirrel. And ran across the street, hit a parked van, and had to come in for x-rays. Did more damage to the van. Mom took pictures. <laughs> Huge dent in this van. Um, yeah. Dog was fine. You know, he walked away with a limp. But otherwise, he walked away great. Like, you know, pride hurt. He didn't get the squirrel. The van, though, the picture, you would have thought a, another car hit it. He hit that van hard. Good. It, it was crazy. <laughs> that, they're just nuts. I mean, I've seen... <laughs> I had this one dog, He would she would run across the room, and then she'd slide because she had no traction, and uh-huh. she'd keep bunting her face against the wall, and every year she would break off another incisor. Oh, I'd have to go and take it off, and she'd break these teeth off every mm-hmm. year. i go, she's going to have run out of teeth eventually, but they would just be these raw, you could see the pulp cavity, and it was sore and painful, oh. so... Um, just, they're not the smartest things most, some of the time, but they're, they're wonderful, wonderful things. All right, let's move on to case of the week. Um, this week we're going to talk about a patient we've been treating for a few months, actually, mm-hmm. and we just saw him the other day, which is why we're thinking of him. Theo is a great Dane, mm-hmm. and he presented initially for some soreness on his leg. And so when we, he was, I think, about six or seven months old at the time. Okay. And uh, when we see, saw him, palpated his joints and his legs, didn't find anything specific, thought maybe he had done a muscle tear or something, put him on some non anti-inflammatory medication. Uh, came back, was about a week later, mm-hmm. one of the other doctors saw him, And at that time, when I first saw him, I said, well, you know, he's a big dog. Maybe he could have this thing called panosteitis, but I didn't do any x-rays. Dr. Anthony just went ahead and did some x-rays, and sure enough, diagnosed him with this condition. Hmm. And panosteitis is basically an inflammation of the bone marrow Hmm. that occurs in growing dogs. And it's basically growing pains. Um, It's not an infection. Hmm. Uh, He put him on some steroids this time, and that really seemed Mm -hmm. to get the symptoms under control. But it can present as a sort of uh, lameness that goes from one leg to another. So it might be strong one leg one week, another another week. 
And they outgrow it. Yeah, I remember him. He he got to the point where he wasn't walking at yeah. all. We had to carry him. Yeah, it can be very it was painful, so painful for him. Yeah. Uh, but the steroids just are the, the best treatment. And now that he's uh, almost full grown now, he was boy, he was. Full. I'll say he's about ten months now, one hundred and thirty six pounds. I yeah. believe last time his weight was. Yeah, he's almost yeah. as tall as me. <laughs> he's huge, gorgeous, and walking beautifully. Yeah. So. If you have a young dog, especially some of these larger breeds, and they're having this lameness and they can't find anything, ask them to do some x-rays. They yep. might be able to figure this out, and it's totally treatable, and the good news is they do outgrow it. Yep. Okay. Next is tech tips, mm -hmm. and this I wanted to bring up because I've had a couple people this week ask about this, dealing with their pets that get car sick. Mm -hmm. So especially when they bring them to the vet or they have to do a long road trip with them. I had a dog in, in this morning that was having some drooling because yes. he just gets sick in the car. Yep. And there are some medications we can prescribe for this. Um, I've used Ace Promazine for years because mm -hmm. it not only helps with their nausea, it helps relax them a little bit too. Yep. So if your pet gets really kind of hyper. Um, Serenia is uh, I got a label for car sickness. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, I think, three or four times the dose yes. for acute yep. uh, um, vomiting. But it really can help dogs that have a really bad time. It gets kind of expensive, but it's a lot cheaper than having your car cleaned of all the, the mm -hmm. vomit that comes out. Um, Dramamine, meclizine is, yeah. is another drug that we'll oftentimes use. But there's got to be some other ways to deal with this other than medication. So what, what do you tell people when they're asking about car sickness? Well, people just like with pets are always different. Um, so like when you said, Serenia works you know, nine times out of ten, a lot of car sick patients that we see here will do the higher dose of the Serenia and they do okay. I'm speaking from personal experience. My dog, he gets terribly car sick since the day we got him. Um, we've always done Serenia the first two times, did great. Anything after that, even with the dose getting higher and higher, he still puked his brains out everywhere. Or he would just sit in the car and just wobble and just drool all over the place until we figured out what was happening. Most people think, you know, if they can actually see outside the scenery or, you know, look around, they're okay. Right. Most dogs do great with that. So if you crack a window, make sure they're in a seat where they can see, usually they're going to be okay. Yeah. My guy, he is not right in the head. He's completely different. So we had to, um, we noticed every time he looked out the window, he would start drooling. So we pulled up the mesh coverings over the car windows. And then we would notice he looked at his sister's window. Then he would be sitting in the middle of the car, start drooling and getting car sick. So we were like, okay. Bought him his own personal little carrier, made him lay down. If he does not look out the window or if the windows are up, he doesn't get car sick. That's totally opposite of He is the opposite of every animal. We have to literally put him in his own carrier, right. cover it. You know, his sister gets mad because she likes to look out the window. But we can't enjoy windows down or nice breezy car rides because yeah. he will puke everywhere. And, like, wow. the medication doesn't work on him. Um, rolling down windows don't work on him. Mm -hmm. But that's just my case for a dog. He's wired backwards. He is wired backwards. For other people, though, Serenia is a beautiful medication. It's just an every 24-hour thing. Um, if you're doing road trips, usually that's not too hard. You can just sneak it in with their breakfast or dinner depending on when you're going to be driving usually we recommend letting them you know 20 minutes half an hour so it can kick in right. especially if you're doing um if you're getting the injection from the clinic there's no chance that they can puke it up but if right. you're doing the oral tablets at home give them a few you know minutes hours so it can absorb into right. their system so they don't accidentally puke it in the car um and usually they do okay with that other things they have you know um do something that keeps them calm, keep them relaxed. Bring on a favorite blanket or a bedding or um, something to chew on while they're busy. Okay. You know, if they're distracted, they're not going to be thinking about or focusing on things that's going to keep them car sick. Um, I bought these lavender calming chews for my, for my boy the first couple of times, and he was doing great with it, and that's what started making me learn. If he looks out the window, that's when he pukes because... When he's chewing on his toys or his chews, his head's down. And as soon as he's done chewing, he looks up and looks out the window. That's when he starts getting car sick again. So keep something busy. They have plenty of dental treats. They have plenty of calming treats. Or if you have like a puppy, puppy chews or things like that to keep them busy in the car. Um, sometimes thunder jackets help um, because it's that yeah. um, secure of like 
someone's hugging them. Right. Um, so that always helps, Or too. someone could hug them. Mm -hmm. Or, like, <laughs> if you have someone to sit in the yeah. back seat with them or sit with them. Or some dogs get car sick when they're in the back. If you have a small dog, they have booster seats. So you can put them in a booster seat um, where they're still protected. Make sure they have their harness and seat belt on so you don't want a dog just freely walking around in the front right. seat. But put them in a booster seat. Usually being closer is better. My boy, when I... If I'm in the car by myself, if he's sitting in the front seat, he's fine. He really only gets car sick if he's in the back seat or further. Sometimes he'll jump to the trunk and I'll find a pile of puke back there. But if he's in the front seat, he'll just stare at me the whole time and he'll be fine. Or if, like if someone's holding him, he's fine. But it's the moment that he's by himself and looking out that window is that's when he gets nauseous or car sick like that so have someone hug them or get something that can help secure them because it, it just makes them feel a little more comfortable right. um and then you know sometimes being a little lighter with breakfast and lunch when you're traveling helps too um giving them a big full stomach can make them feel a little more sick while they're in that car, especially if it is just emotion right. sickness of it all. Yeah, save the big meal for when they get to where they're mm -hmm. going. Like, you don't want a big meal and then get on a roller coaster. That's just asking for trouble. Right. And one thing, I just want to, I think we talked about this before, but don't let your pet stick their head out the window. Oh, yeah. They yeah. love it. We had a dog lost an eye because mm -hmm. of that. Um, cracking the window, letting them get some breeze in is fine, mm -hmm. but if they can get their face through, that's not good. That's not okay. Yeah. Well, and then always make sure your pet's in a seat belt. Like we all, right. there are so many different types of seat belts to put in the back seat or in the car or anything, or even smaller dog booster seats, carriers, whatever you want to do. But just letting your dog have free reign of the car, that's part of the motion sickness as well. Okay. Um, and that's also part of the discomfort. Make some place where they can relax. They have plenty of seat belts or car seat covers that you can mm -hmm. put on. Um, so, you know, my dog, yes, he likes to look out the window when we're stationary. I will let him do it. But he can only get as far as the seatbelt's going to let him, and that's usually just enough to poke his nose through. Yeah. And that's okay, but we don't want a whole head to go through because then you have to worry about your dog trying to jump out, choking, right. losing an eye, you know, getting a bee hit in the face, get stung or something. Like There are so many things that happen. Driving through a swarm of flies it's and getting eye worms. Exactly. Yeah. Like, so many things. And, and cats, too, they they don't usually throw up, but they'll, they'll pee and poop when they get mm -hmm. really anxious in the car. So one, having them in the carrier helps. Having a thick towel in there helps so mm -hmm. they, they, they'll absorb it so they don't come to the vet sloshing around in their pee. Yeah. Um, but that can be very helpful. But checking on them and making sure. Mm -hmm. Cats tend to like to have a, a nice closed-in space to, 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 yep. to, to hide away. Or then even medications, too. Um, right. You know, we try something called gabapentin here. It mm -hmm. really, really helps most cats calm down. And, and, you know, and the pheromone wipes yeah, and sprays can be very helps. helpful, too. Or they have lavender calming collars that you can try for yeah. cats too. Or you know, there are there that. are a few of those, yeah. Um, or there are even some cats where they they hate the carrier. Um, like my one cousin, her cat hates the carrier. Will poop and pee in it when they're in a car. So she'll take the carrier, put them in the car with it, open the carrier door. He sits on the dashboard, in the, or not the dashboard, the back window part, right. and watch people as they drive. That's the only way he'll be quiet. Wow. And relax. If she keeps him in a carrier, he will meow the whole ride, and he will poop and pee in there. Yeah. But if he's out and he can just look at the scenery, I keep telling her it's not safe because if, heaven forbid, something happens, he's out and about. But for now, knock on wood, he's been doing okay. He's calm. He's happy. Most people think he's stuffed until he starts moving. Mm -hmm. So it keeps him happy. <laughs> I had a cat. She just would not sit in the in the carrier or the seat. She wanted to be on my lap. She uh -huh. actually put her feet up on the steering wheel so she could look out the window while mm -hmm. we're driving. Probably not the best way to drive with a cat, but otherwise she was miserable. Mm -hmm. Yep, miserable they, in the carrier. They have their special ways they do it. And then yeah. I had another cat. He's just terrified. He'll try and find his way underneath the seat. Yeah. Well, you don't want to get underneath your feet. That's just another thing with cats. You know, yeah. get them used to the carrier. Don't only take it out. When they're going somewhere, right. make sure that carrier stays out all the time at home. Keep it someplace where they can eat next to, put a bed in there where they can sleep in it. Make it where that carrier is a safe, quiet environment for them. Don't make it the punishment carrier that right. you only go in when you're only going to get poked and prodded or you're going to be in a five-car ride. Exactly, yeah. Keep them comfortable. Yeah. All right, um, next week uh, we're going to be talking about joint supplements, mm -hmm. which is... Um, Supplements that are used for treating um, 
hip dysplasia, arthritis. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of variation in the quality and the types of supplements out there. So I wanted to let people know what to look for, um, what to expect when they're using joint supplements. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll have our usual things. Um, so until next time, I'm Dr. Kim Rosek. I'm Brittany. See ya. Bye.